Welcome. In this series of videos, we're going to take a closer look at hypothesis testing. Uh, what is a hypothesis test? What is it used for? And how does it work? Uh, in this day, it seems like we're constantly bombarded with new information, and whether we want to or not, we automatically make decisions about this information. Uh, we believe this information, we don't believe this information, uh, we think this information means this, we think it means that. Wouldn't there be a nice way to determine whether or not we're making the right decisions when we see new information? That's where hypothesis testing comes in. A hypothesis test allows us to measure our decision with an alternative decision and determine which one is more likely. And if another decision is more likely, that gives us a good reason to change our mind. So we're going to look at the basic parts of a hypothesis test in this video, and in the following videos we're going to look at specific kinds of hypothesis tests and work some examples. So let's get started. The first step when doing a hypothesis test is to identify the competing hypotheses for your test. Each hypothesis test starts with two uh, possible hypotheses called the null hypothesis and the alternate hypothesis. The null hypothesis, we, we use the symbol h sub 0, and the null hypothesis should always be an equation. It might be something like the mean is 3 and a half, or it might be something like the proportion is 85 percent, or it could be something like uh, the mean value before is the same as the mean value after. Those are just a couple examples of what a null hypothesis would look like. But a null hypothesis is traditionally given in the form of an equation. Your alternate hypothesis represents the other possibility. So if our null hypothesis is that the mean value uh, from some set of data is 3.5, your alternate hypothesis might be that the mean is greater than 3.5. Or it might be that the mean value is less than three and a half. Or it could simply be that the mean value is not three and a half. It just sort of depends on the opposing viewpoint uh, you or somebody else might have. Okay? If your null hypothesis is that the proportion is 85%, your alternate could be that it's more than 85%. It could be that the proportion is less than 85%, or it could just be that the proportion is not 85%. Okay? And similarly, if we, if we start with a null hypothesis that two means are the same, then your alternate could be that the mean value before is more than the mean value after. It could be that the mean value before is less than the mean value after, or it could just be that they are not the same. So notice an alternate hypothesis is traditionally given in the form of an inequality or just a not equal to statement. The alternate hypothesis we use uh, tells us what kind of hypothesis to test we're going to do. If your alternate hypothesis is, say, something like mean greater than 3.5, then we are doing what's called a right tail test. If your alternate hypothesis is mean less than 3.5, we're going to be doing a left tail test. And if your alternate hypothesis is just a non-equal statement, then you're doing what's called a two tail test. And these are all going to look uh, a little bit different. Once you've identified your null and alternate hypothesis, your next step is going to be to collect some sample data. Now, what's going to happen here, let's just take a, a for instance, let's look at the example where our null hypothesis is that the mean is 3.5, and, and our alternate hypothesis is that the mean is more than 3.5. Okay, then we're going to collect some sample data. So if we're talking about means, our sample data would be a sample mean. And let's say in this example we have a sample mean of 3.68. Okay, clearly 3.68 is greater than 3.5. Does that mean our alternate hypothesis is true and our null hypothesis is false? Well, not necessarily. That's not what we're doing here. Because again, our sample data comes from a simple random sample. And anytime we use random samples, you know, strange things that can happen. So what we're really trying to figure out 
in this hypothesis test is whether or not the difference between 3.68 and 3.5 is statistically significant or is it likely due to random chance here. So the two possibilities are that this difference is statistically significant or that the difference is not so significant and more likely due to random chance. If we decide that 3.68 represents a statistically significant difference from 3.5, then we should change our mind about the mean being 3.5. Instead, we should assume that the mean is actually going to be more than 3.5. If on the other hand we decide that the difference between 3.68 and 3.5 is not so significant, then we can just chalk this up to random chance because again it is a random sample and sometimes differences are just due to random chance. If we decide the difference is due to random chance, then we probably shouldn't change our mind here and stick with the notion that the mean is most likely three and a half. Okay, so this is what the hypothesis test does. Which of these is more likely? So the next step is to find the test statistic. And the test statistic depends on which kind of hypothesis test we're doing. It might be the Z statistic, it might be the T statistic, or it might be the chi-square statistic. Okay, It will be one of those three depending on what hypothesis test we are doing. To find these test statistics we are going to use technology. We'll either use, uh, you can use a graphing calculator or you can use some other type of software, but uh, we typically use technology to calculate these because they are messy calculations. Once we know our test statistic, our next step is to find the p-value. And p-values are computed as areas. Let's say our test statistic is a z-statistic. If our test statistic is a z-statistic, that means we're using the normal distribution. So a normal distribution curve looks something like this. And our z-statistic, let's say it's this value right here. If this is my z statistic, the p value is the area under the curve to the right of the z statistic if we're doing a right tail test. Okay, so this area is the p value. If we're doing a left tail test, then your z statistic is most likely going to be to the left of the mean, and this area would represent your p value. If we are doing a two tail test, then we're going to have the z statistic to the right of the mean, the opposite z statistic to the left of the mean, and your p-value is going to be the sum of two, the two areas. So this would be for a two-tailed test. So if we compute these areas, we call that the p-value. If we're using the t-statistic, we would do the same thing, except we wouldn't be using the normal curve. We'd be using the t-distribution, which looks similar or the chi-square distribution, which looks uh, a little bit different. But in all of these cases, we compute our p-value as an area, and which area we're computing depends on whether we're doing a right-tailed, a left-tailed, or a two-tailed test. Now, how do we interpret the p-value? We can think of the p-value as the probability of seeing our sample results if the null hypothesis is true. Okay, so again, if our null hypothesis is that the mean is three and a half, and our alternate hypothesis is that the mean is more than three and a half, we had a sample mean of 3.68. Our p-value would tell us the probability of getting a sample mean of 3.68 under the assumption that this is true. So if the mean is three and a half, what's the probability that we could take a simple random sample and get a mean of 3.68, okay? So if the p-value is really small, that means there's not much chance that we would get this sample data given that the null hypothesis is true. So if our p-value is really small, we're going to maybe change our mind about the null hypothesis in favor of the alternate hypothesis. If the p-value isn't so small, then we don't have enough reason to change our mind about the null hypothesis and we would just stick with whatever we stated in the null hypothesis. Okay, so the p-value is the number we use to make our decision and that is the next step. You compare the p-value to the significance level to make your decision.
Anytime you do a hypothesis test, you're going to have what's called a level of significance. And typically, the level of significance is one of these three values. It's either 1%, 5%, or 10%. Okay. It is possible to have a different level of significance, but these are the three uh, we see most often. And the level, of the level of significance is the maximum probability of making a type 1 error. Okay. A type 1 error is incorrectly rejecting a null hypothesis that is actually true. If our null hypothesis is true, we would not want our hypothesis test to result in rejecting that true statement. If we do reject a null hypothesis that is true, we're making what's called a type 1 error. The level of significance represents how much we can live with in terms of making that mistake. So if we have a level of significance of 0.05, that means the end result of our hypothesis test, there's a maximum 5% probability that we're going to make a type 1 error. Okay, so setting the level of significance at 5% means that's what we can live with. And that's the most often used level of significance. But that's what that means. And that is the number we compare our p-value to. So if the p-value is less than alpha, we are going to reject the null hypothesis because if p-value is less than alpha, that means we've seen something statistically significant. So in other words, the difference between our sample data and the value from our null hypothesis, the difference between those two is statistically significant. So we would reject that null hypothesis in favor of the alternate hypothesis. If the p-value is greater than alpha, even if it's small, if it's greater than alpha, that means we, we haven't shown a statistically significant difference. So that would indicate that the difference between our sample data and the value in our null hypothesis is more likely due to random chance. And if the difference is more likely due to random chance, then we should not reject the null hypothesis based on that. So if the p-value is more than alpha, we are going to fail to reject the null hypothesis. Now it's important to note if we fail to reject the null hypothesis, that does not mean we've proven that the alternate hypothesis is true, not by a long shot. All it means is we don't have enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis. Okay. So then once we've made our decision whether or not to reject the null hypothesis or not reject the null hypothesis, we're going to make the appropriate conclusion. So we should respond to whatever claim is being made in the problem. Okay, so in other words, we're going to put some context to our decision. So let's just look at an actual example here of an opportunity for us to use a hypothesis test. So in this example, we have the CEO of a large company claiming that more than 90% of her employees are happy with the pay and benefits they receive. Our job is to test this claim at the 0.05 level of significance. Okay, so the claim is that uh, the level of satisfaction is more than 90%. So in other words, the proportion of employees that are happy is more than 90%. So our null hypothesis here is going to be that the proportion is exactly 90%, and our alternate hypothesis will be that the proportion is more than 90% as the CEO claims. Okay, so this is what the CEO claims. Remember our null hypothesis should always be given in the form of an equation. So the appropriate equation here would be that the proportion is 90 percent and our alternate hypothesis is going to be that the proportion is more than 90 percent. After you've identified your hypotheses, the next step would be to do a simple random sample of employees from this company and compute the sample proportion. Okay, so the next step would be to find a sample proportion. Okay, and you know it's likely going to be different from 90%. So let's say, for example, uh, maybe our sample proportion comes out to be, uh, let's say, 90.919. Okay, so let's say we do a simple random sample of employees from this company and the proportion of employees who are happy with their pay and benefits is 0.919. Okay, our job is to figure out if this is statistically higher than 90% or if we just got a higher number due to random chance. So we would compute a test statistic based on this 
sample value. We would do that using technology, either calculator or some type of software. Based on our test statistic, we would find the p-value. Uh, in this case, we would be doing a right-tailed test. So let's say we're using the normal distribution. Let's say our test statistic is right here. Let's say it's a z statistic. Our p-value would represent uh, this area to the right of our test statistic. And then there are going to be two possibilities. Either p is less than or equal to 0.05, or the p-value is going to be greater than 0.05. Okay, 0 0.05 being our level of significance. That is the number we want to compare our p-value to. If we find our p-value is less than or equal to 0 0.05, that indicates that this is a statistically significant difference. Our sample data is statistically significantly higher than the value from our null hypothesis. So we would reject the null hypothesis, and our conclusion would be that there is enough evidence to support the CEO's claim that more than 90% of her employees are happy with the pay and benefits they receive. So that would be our conclusion if our p-value is less than 0.05. On the other hand, if we find that the p-value is greater than 0.05, then we cannot reject the null. We do not reject the null hypothesis. And the reason we do not reject the null is because p-value greater than our level of significance indicates that the difference between our sample proportion and our null value is more likely just due to random chance. It is not statistically significant. So based off of this test, we would not want to reject the null. And our conclusion would be that there is not sufficient evidence to support the CEO's claim that more than 90% of employees are happy. Okay, the CEO's claim might be right, but we don't have enough evidence to support it uh, based on the sample we took and the sample proportion that we found. So this would be the conclusion we would make if our p-value is greater than 0 0.05. So a couple things to notice when you make a conclusion based on a hypothesis test. The only possibilities are um, that the evidence supports one of your hypotheses or that there's not enough evidence to support. We never prove anything because again we're using random samples. A random sample doesn't prove anything. So your conclusion should never be that we accept the null or that we accept the alternate hypothesis. Okay, we're not we're not proving anything enough to the level where we accept one of these things to be true. We're simply trying to decide if we have enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis or if there's not enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis. Let's look at one more and just kind of run through uh, what this is going to look like. So here a cookie company claims that the average chocolate chip cookie has 14 chocolate chips. A regular eater of these cookies believes that that is not accurate. So in this case our null hypothesis would be that the mean number of chips is 14. Your alternate hypothesis would be that the mean is not 14. Okay. Notice the regular eater of cookies didn't say that he thinks that there are more than 14 chocolate chips or that there are less than 14 chocolate chips. Uh, the eater just doesn't think that it's accurate. So unless we have reason to uh, believe that the mean is more than 14 or less than 14, we should just say that the mean is not 14 and we're going to be doing a two-tailed test. Okay. So this is what the eater, the cookie eater, believes to be true. This is what the company claims is true. Okay, So in this case our null hypothesis is the company's claim and our alternate hypothesis is what the eater believes. And again the point of our hypothesis test is to determine which of these is more likely. Okay, So your next step would be to get a random sample of chocolate chip cookies and count how many chocolate chips there are. And that would give us our sample mean. So let's say, for example, our sample mean is, I don't know, let's say the sample mean is 12.98. So we've, we've done a random sample of a certain number of cookies, and we found that the average number of chocolate chips in those cookies was 12.98. Then, based off our sample mean, we would compute our test statistic. Um, in this case, since this is a mean, your test statistic is actually going to be a t-statistic. So we would be on the t-distribution. 
and our t statistic might be uh, here. Let's say this is my t statistic. And here we're doing a two tailed test because our alternate hypothesis is just not equal to. So we would take our t statistic and the opposite t statistic, and our p value would be the sum of the areas in both tails uh, under this t distribution graph. So the sum of these two areas would be our p-value. And again, there's, it's going to come down to two possibilities. Either our p-value is less than or equal to 0 0.05, or our p-value is more than 0 0.05. If the p-value is less than 0 0.05, we would reject the null. So in other words, uh, we would reject the company's claim that the average chocolate chip cookie has 14 chips. Uh, we would say there's not enough evidence to support the company's claim. If the p-value is more than 0.5, then we would not reject the null, which means our evidence would support the cookie company's claim. Okay, so the conclusion we would make is uh, there is sufficient evidence to support the company's claim that the average cookie has 14 chips. So that's how we make our decision whether or not to believe the company's claim. Okay. I will point out here that the method I'm describing for hypothesis testing is called the p-value method. Uh, there are other methods for conducting a hypothesis test. Uh, another method you might see would be the confidence interval method. And uh, just to give you an idea on this particular example, if I was going to use the confidence interval method, uh, with the level of significance at 0 0.05, uh, Another way we can conduct this hypothesis test is to construct a 95% confidence interval. And we would do 95% based on our level of significance being 5%. If our level of significance were 10%, we would do a 90% confidence interval and so on. And if we use the confidence interval, let's say our 95% confidence interval for the average number of chocolate chips, let's say our confidence interval is something like uh, 13.21 to 14.98. Let's say it's something like this. We would look at this confidence interval and what we would try to decide is, is 14 in here? So if the value from your null hypothesis is in the confidence interval, then that means we should not reject that null hypothesis. Okay, because there's a certain magnitude of likelihood that 14 is the correct answer if it's in that 95% confidence interval. So if 14 is in there, so in this case the answer would be yes, then we would not reject the null. On the other hand, if our 95% confidence interval is 14.18 to 15.2, for example, 14 is not in this confidence interval. So this is the way we did our hypothesis test, and our 95% confidence interval were this one. 14 is not in there, which means we should reject the null. Because it's not very likely that 14 is the average number of chips if it's not even in the 95% confidence interval estimate. So this is another method you'll sometimes see used, but mostly I'm going to stick with the p-value method because that's the one that's used uh, most often. But just understand there are, these aren't all done exactly the same way. Okay, so that is a quick overview of what a hypothesis test looks like. In the videos that follow, we will look at each of the specific types of hypothesis tests, and we will look at how to find uh, the test statistic and the p-value for each of these uh, using the graphing calculator.